Hi, my name is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast of the New Testament. I'll be using as the text the King James Version, along with the Joseph Smith Translation. Although this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort's been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. I'll also be using quotes from general authorities of the Church, the Apostles and Prophets, and BYU professors and others, and uh, every word out of the Scriptures themselves. So if you're ready for a really detailed analysis of the New Testament, you've come to the right place. Welcome. Hi there, welcome back. This is going to be for John chapter 21. So we've had the resurrection and we've had many witnesses of it. And so this will conclude the uh, Gospels uh, with John chapter 21 and a few verses out of Matthew as well. So let's go ahead and read John 21. Verse 1, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael the Cana of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other of his disciples, that's probably Andrew and Philip. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go fishing, I go a fishing. The apostles did not know what was expected of them now that Jesus had died, so they just thought that they'd go back to their regular businesses and and uh, just go on as normal. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was him, that it was Jesus. This is probably, what, Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday of the next week? Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat about unto him, for he was naked. He's not actually naked, that's just an expression just meant that he was without an outer garment. The adjective traditionally means lightly clad, and Peter would be wearing a loincloth as the modesty of Jewish sensibilities demanded, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came into in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have caught, which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Now there's some symbolism there. The net not being broken is symbolic that they'll be able to now catch uh, catch men in their nets as uh, they go out go out as missionaries. Also, uh, the fact that they've caught so many fish. Um, might also be that they're now providing enough for their families so that they can now spend full time as apostles uh, being able to go out so that they could use this food. Remember I mentioned in a previous episode that um, there was a salt factory on the Dead Sea or on the Sea of Galilee uh, which also was used uh, to preserve food. So this might be uh, their year supply or multiple year supplies of food so that they could uh, provide adequately for their families. Obviously, they in catching this many fish, they probably couldn't eat nor sell all of it before it got ruined. So they're going to preserve it for later. Verse 12, Jesus saith unto them, come and, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Do we love the Savior more than our temporal occupations and things? He saith unto, said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. The Greek verb translated in English as feed actually means to shepherd, to tend, to take care of. The great shepherd was calling on the chief apostle to serve as the shepherd of the Lord's sheep through the tribulations of the coming decades. The fisherman was now to be a shepherd. His presidency and responsibility mandated a permanent focus, a refocus on his life's work. And that was uh, in verse by verse. Verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. After three denials, three avowals. 
President Benson said, We realize, as in times past, that some of the sheep will rebel and are as a wild flock which fleeth from the shepherd, but most of our problems stem from lack of loving and attentive shepherding. With a shepherd's loving care, many of our young people, our young lambs, would not be wandering. And if they were the and if they were the crook of the shepherd's staff, a loving arm would retrieve them. With a shepherd's care, many of those who are now independent of the flock can still be reclaimed. That was um, in verse by verse. Verse 18, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. This is a prediction of how Peter would be, would be uh, killed by crucifixion. Legend has it that he was crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified the same way Jesus was. This spake, he, by, this spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he'd said, he said unto him, Follow me. This, uh, then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? So he's talking here about John. John may have gotten the idea of asking that he live until the second coming from Jesus' comments in Matthew 16, where it says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In other words, uh, this is more. there's probably more than just John that's been translated. Verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that this disciple should not die yet jesus said unto him he shall not die but if he will that i that he tarry till i come what is that to thee translated beings will still die but their dying will be different than uh, than a than a person that gets buried so john was translated in uh, in doctrine and covenants chapter or section 7 it says and i the lord said unto me unto unto the Lord said unto me, John, my beloved, what desirest thou? For if you shall ask what you will, it shall be granted unto you. And I said unto him, Lord, give unto me power over death, that I may live and bring souls unto thee. And the Lord said unto me, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, because thou desirest this thing, thou shalt tarry until I come in my glory, and shalt prophesy before nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. And for this cause the Lord said unto Peter, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? For he desired of me that he might bring souls unto me, but thou desirest that thou might, might, mightest speedily come unto me in my kingdom. I say unto thee, Peter, this was a good desire, but my beloved has desired that he might do more of a greater or a greater work yet among men than what he has before done. Yea, he has undertaken a greater work, therefore I will make him as, as a flaming fire and a ministering angel. He shall minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation who dwell on the earth. And I will make thee to minister for him and for my for thy brother James, and unto these unto you three I will give this power and the keys of this ministry until I come. Verily I say unto you, ye have ye, ye shall both have according to your desires, for ye both joy in which in that which ye have desired. Joseph Smith said that John the Revelator is among the ten tribes of Israel who had been led away by the king of Assyria to prepare them for their return from their long dispersion to again possess the land of their fathers. Uh, there's a story told of, of uh, when, John, when Joseph Smith was traveling with his bodyguard uh, on a road one time that uh, a traveler or a person coming on the other side of the road was coming in the opposite direction toward them. And Joseph told the bodyguard to wait here while I go talk to this man. And as uh, Joseph uh, spoke with the person uh, and then came back to his bodyguard, he told the bodyguard that uh, that was John the Beloved who had told him that uh, Joseph needed to go back to where they came from because they, had, they needed to get something. So John is not just on the other continent, the European continent, which I thought he would be, but he's all over the place doing whatever the Lord needs him to do. Continuing, Matthew uh, chapter 28, verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Remember back uh, late, or earlier it says that they were supposed to meet him in Galilee. We know how and under what circumstances the Lord ministered among the Nephites and have every reason to believe that he followed the same pattern in Palestine. It is pleasant to suppose it happened at the same, same site on which he preached the Sermon on the Mount, for, for that was the ordination sermon of the Twelve. Verse 17, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. 
Everyone there had gone forth and touched his resurrected body, just like the Nephites did at his appearance among them. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We must not leave this part of our discussion without recording that without question there were many unmentioned appearances. We know he was with them from time to time for 40 days, and it is unthinkable to assume that he did not appear to the Blessed Virgin, whose son he was, to Lazarus, whom he called forth from four days of death, to Mary and Martha, whom he loved, and to hosts of others whose names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life, never to be blotted out. And that was by Elder McConkie. Uh, Over in Luke, it says, And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was taken from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. In Mark, it says in verse 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Jesus taught the disciples what and how to teach the gospel, taught them about the apostasy in last days, garments, marriage, prayer circles, according to the Apocrypha. So that's interesting, isn't it? Anyway, uh, that's the end of the chapter, and that's the end of our reading. Uh, Let me just read a few other things here of interest. Um, I read about John the Beloved and that he was uh, translated. Um, And that happened among the the Nephite 12, uh, remember in 3 Nephi 28, it says, And he said unto them, Behold, I know your thoughts, and ye have desired the thing which John, my beloved, who was with me in, in my ministry before that I was lifted up by the Jews, desired of me. Um, so anyway, those three were also translated. And then in section 76, Joseph Smith's testimony, and now after the many testimonies which which have been given of him, this is the testimony last of all which we give of him, that he lives. For we saw him even on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice of of him. We heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him and through him and of him the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. There are also other witnesses of the resurrected Jesus Christ. The following is a list of Latter-day witnesses of the resurrected Christ. We know Joseph Smith, Martin Harris, Oliver Cowdery, Newell Knight, Lyman White, Orson F. Whitney, Heber J. Grant, John Taylor, Lorenzo Snow, George Q. Cannon, George F. Richards, Joseph F. Smith, David O. McKay, Legrand Richards, David B. Haight. And that was uh, a list by uh, in the book Verse by Verse. Um, so what of the resurrection? Here's some interesting things about the resurrection. Um, those who have spoken authoritatively about the resurrection have sometimes spoken of it as an ordinance involving keys. The same way other priesthood ordinances require the operation of priesthood power and priesthood keys. President Brigham Young has given us profound and insightful commentary on the core doctrine of the Christian faith. All who have lived on the earth according to the best light they had and would have received the fullness of the gospel, had it been preached to them, are worthy of a glorious resurrection and will attain to this by being administered for in the flesh by those who have the authority. All others will have a resurrection and receive a glory except those who have sinned against the Holy Ghost. It is supposed by this people that we have all the ordinances in our possession for life and salvation and exaltation and and that we are administering in these ordinances. This is not the case. We are in possession of all the ordinances that can be administered in the flesh, but there are other ordinances and administrations that must be administered beyond this world. I know you would ask, what are they? I will mention one. We have not, neither can we receive here the ordinance and the keys of the resurrection. They, have, they will be given to those who have passed off this stage of action and, and have received their bodies again, as many have already done, and many more will. They will be ordained by those who hold the keys of the resurrection to go forth and resurrect the, the saints, just as we, re, we receive the ordinance of baptism, then the keys of authority to baptize others for the remission of their sins. This is one of the ordinances we cannot receive here, and there are many more. We hold the authority to, uh, to dispose of alter and change the elements, but we have not received authority to organize native element to, to even make a spear of grass grow. Closer to our day, President Kimball, in a general conference address in April of 1977, confirmed that no one now living holds the keys of resurrection, and that is not because we lack the desire to possess them. President Kimball said, do we, not, do we have the keys of resurrection? I buried my mother when I was 11, my father when I was in my early 20s. I have missed my parents much. 
If I had the power of resurrection, as did the Savior of the world, I would have been tempted to try to have the, have kept them longer. We do not know of anyone who can resurrect the dead, as did the, Jesus the Christ, when he came back to mortality. President Kimball promised the faithful will receive not only the keys of resurrection, but also the power of Godhood in the resurrection. We talk about the gospel in its fullness, yet we realize that a large part is still available to us as we prepare, as we perfect, and as we become more like our God. In the Doctrine and Covenants, we read of Abraham, who has already attained Godhood. He has received many powers, undoubtedly, that we would like to have and will eventually get if we continue faithful and perfect our lives. Again, that was in the April 1977 General Conference. When Jesus' spirit re-entered his physical body in the garden tomb that first Easter morning, he became the first person on this earth to receive the keys of resurrection. It is true that he inherited the power to take up his body again from his father, Elohim, at the time of, of his mortal birth, but he received the keys of resurrection only after his own resurrection. Joseph Fielding Smith explained the sequence this way. Jesus Christ did for us something that we could not do for ourselves, through his infinite atonement. On the third day after the crucifixion, he took up his body and gained the keys of the resurrection and thus has power to open the graves for all men. But this he could not do until he had first passed through death himself and conquered. So that uh, gives us a little bit of an in insight here as to uh, his appearances to the Father, because if he received keys of resurrection, he would have had to have received them by the laying on of hands. So he would have appeared to Heavenly Father to receive those and then come back uh, to visit with those uh, that were still on earth. Uh, I hadn't thought of that before. That's a new insight to me. I don't know if that's true or not, but that seems uh, reasonable. This is important doctrine, for it means that the keys of resurrection are conferred after one has been resurrected, and those keys are then used to resurrect others. Jesus was the prototype, having obtained the keys of resurrection himself after his own experience with resurrection. He then possessed power to resurrect all others. According to President Brigham Young, those keys of resurrection first acquired by the Savior are then further given, extended, or delegated to others who have died and been resurrected. They will be ordained by those who held the keys of the resurrection to go forth and resurrect the saints, just as we receive the ordinance of baptism, then the keys of authority to baptize others. Thus, in one respect, we might think of the ordinance of resurrection as being like other ordinances which we see performed on this earth. It involves those who possess the authority and keys of resurrection. Erastus Snow also taught the resurrection will be conducted much as other things are done in the kingdom by delegation. Just as we cannot bless or baptize ourselves, so we cannot resurrect ourselves. Ordinances are performed on our behalf by those who are authorized to perform the ordinances. Knowing that we are, we do, know, knowing what we do about the importance of worthy fathers guiding and blessing their families in righteousness, it does not seem out of order to believe that worthy fathers and priesthood holders will have the privilege of calling forth their wives or their children or even other members of their family from the grave. Is it not the order of heaven for righteous patriarchs, fathers, grandfathers, and others to bless, baptize, and perform other ordinances for their loved ones. Before Jesus was resurrected, only his Father, our Father in heaven, possessed the keys of resurrection, even though as the Son of God he possessed the power of life in himself independently. After he was resurrected, Jesus acquired the keys of resurrection, which could then be given to others. The illuminating statements of President Brigham Young, President Kimball, Joseph Smith, or Joseph Fielding Smith, taken together, help us to see once again that God's house is a house of order. As a result of his own resurrection, Jesus now controls all power and all keys under the direction of his Father, which he delegates to others as they are worthy and become prepared to possess the various powers of godliness. These powers are then used to bless the human family. This is true for the keys of resurrection as well as all other power and authority. And that was by Andrew Skinner in The Garden Tomb. So anyway, that's the end of the reading for today, and and uh, we, we are happy about the resurrection because that's uh, how we're all going to be, that uh, death is not the final end of us, that we will all be resurrected, and that Jesus made it possible for that to happen. I bear that testimony and say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.